Hi there, everybody. I'm uh, Jeff Edgers, the national arts reporter at The Washington Post, and uh, welcome to Washington Post Live. We're uh, fortunate to have two people here who can talk about uh, two issues that are really key in uh, what's going on in our world right now. Uh, this is under the heading of coronavirus uh, relief efforts, but uh, CORE, which is the organization that these two uh, co-founded, is also uh, uh, working a lot in Haiti right now and has for uh, more than a decade. And uh, CORE is a nonprofit that basically uh, helps people in the wake of man-made and natural disasters. It stands for Community Organized Relief Effort. And we're, we're so pleased to have Anne Lee, uh, who's been doing this work for years and years, and uh, Act Academy Award-winning actor and director Sean Penn. So uh, thanks for, thanks for uh, being with us today. Good to be here. Thanks for having uh, and I'm gonna, uh, yeah, and uh, let's start with you because you um, you are in Haiti right now, and uh, we're seeing the uh, what I'd call uh, horrific story, images and stories about what's going on there in the wake of the earthquake. Um, uh, just tell us what you're seeing right now down there. You know, it it really recalls 2010 in a lot of ways, but in in, in so many more ways, it's much worse. Um, just the fact that we are seeing um, an incredible amount of destruction in homes and people that are still trapped under the rubble to, to layer on top of that, the insecurity that's making it difficult for the humanitarian assistance to get in, along with a huge amount of food insecurity that's been happening over the last few years. All of these layers are creating just the perfect storm um, of, of a very complex and difficult situation, and in some ways a lot worse than the 2010 earthquake. Um, and we're not even talking and, and including in the fact that they are still under um, COVID restrictions and, and that we're still dealing with a major pandemic. Um, Sean, in uh, 2010, you went down there and uh, you thought you were going for a couple of weeks to help out, and you ended up staying for nine months and running one of the relocation camps. Um, tell us, as, as far as you can tell, how, how CORE is helping right now and uh, sort of what the biggest needs and challenges in Haiti are at the moment. Yeah, well, I, I, I will probably quickly defer back to Anne because she is there. I'll be joining her this next, this, this coming week. Uh, but, you, you know, we were in um, with, our, with heavy equipment teams and, and medical right away, um, I, I, I believe, uh, on day one. Um, the, the heavy equipment is there both to clear access routes, the roads, as well as to initially help with search and rescue efforts and, and, and general rubble removal to, to, to let, you know, to move towards the eventuality of getting uh, what remains back on its feet with the the ability of movement, uh, but Anne can be much more specific to 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 that, and and especially I think it's important that she rather than I speak to what the current needs are, uh, so that pe people understand it. And I'll I'll I'll, right I'll, now, uh, I'll let you. I'm sorry. Sure, I was just going to say, more than ever right now, I know that there's a lot of inclination to send things. I know that there's been a lot of mistrust from the 2010 of, you know, misuse of funds, but we need to support local businesses. <clears throat> there's a lot of businesses that are not affected that need the support and to be bringing in things from the outside is not helpful. We need basically to support our existing structures here. So purchasing locally, supporting our local governments and working within what is here is going to help in the long term. So sending things from, you know, outside in is not going to be helpful. So please just, you know, find reliable organizations like CORE to be able to send cash and send money so that we can actually support the local efforts that are here for example, for our from our um, all Haitian team and our local uh, uh, suppliers, and and really sort of look long term rather than just these short term efforts. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to ask you. I mean, obviously, we're, this earthquake happens after the assassination of a president um, in the midst of a pandemic. I uh, uh, sense that vaccination rates are not great uh, in Haiti. Um, how does that complicate what you're trying to do? How does that compare to what you were dealing with in 2010? 
for example, just getting our materials out to the affected areas. There's a number of roadblocks that people have made because they're quite frustrated. There's a lot of insecurity that makes it very difficult for the assistance to get out. That is a factor that's so different from what we saw in 2010. On top of that, you know, the COVID restrictions or COVID being here is just very difficult. Like the vaccine rates are so low. I think only about 25,000 vaccines have actually been completed thus far. We have 500,000 vaccines that have been donated that are going to be expired in November and getting these vaccines out are, is so important at the same time while we're dealing with this other crisis in the South. May I What's just qualify? I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to just uh, be clear to, to make sure that uh, uh, anyone listening knows that when, when Ann says, you, you know, not, it's not about sending things, that does, that does not uh, that ex that does not include me the needed medical supplies, et cetera. She's talking specific, most more specifically about textiles, and you know, people want to send clothes and shoes and all in hats. <laughs> um, th those are the things that we want to leave to the local uh, merchants, artisans, um, and others to create and sell there. Uh, Sean, in, in 2010, uh, notably, you uh, saw that there was a need for morphine and people weren't getting it and they were dying and they were injured and it was a horrific idea, the idea that they were suffering like this and you found a way to get it down there. So I don't know if it's a supply issue with the vaccine. I don't know what supply issues you're dealing with uh, as far as medical supplies. Uh, are you finding you're able to mobilize people now? Are you working connections to try to, uh, to, to get, this, uh, get this medicine down there and get, this, uh, get the vaccinations going in, in a better way? I'm not asking that question very well, but you know what I'm saying. You know, it was only about two weeks prior to the assassination of President Moise that, that Ann and I had a, had a, a Zoom conference with him uh, and, and, and were able to get, you know, I think it wasn't until then, until the Haitian government was truly motivated uh, to start um, implementing uh, COVID vaccine programs uh, and, and initially with their healthcare workers. So at, after that conversation, we were very quickly mobilizing because we finally were able to do it in concert with the government, which was going to be necessary in, in terms of being able to re make requests on vaccines from the United States. Um, an initial 1.5 million vaccines was committed. Uh, we were getting ready to rock and roll. And uh, then that horrible assassination happened and the country went into lockdown again. And now the earthquake has happened. So we're trying to juggle a lot of balls at, at once. And again, can speak to where we are currently in our Haiti program with, with the vac vaccine uh, implementation. We have about 25 vaccine locations, and we work, we're working with great partners on the ground. We work through the, the Ministry of Health, with Partners in Health, with Jeskio, and the idea was to expand quickly to about 60 before the earthquake happened. Right now, we still want to keep pushing out those vaccines. It's so critically important, especially right now when we're going to get pot potentially some congregate set settings in the south to get vaccines even into the South as we're dealing with this emergency. So one of the things that we are really focused on is having sort of a package of services, not just the debris removal, the health uh, mobile units that we have, um, shelter kits, because there's still a storm coming our way next week again, um, but also to get vaccines down into the South as, as quickly as possible. So Anne, it's, it's not an issue of, uh, of, of people resisting it, it's an issue of supply, or are you also seeing people resisting it for various reasons? There is resistance. There is most definitely some resistance. It's sort of this chicken or egg situation where I believe because the supply wasn't there, that the government and people didn't want to create a, de a demand that they couldn't actually supply. Now that we have the supply, there has been a huge amount of effort to get the mobilization, the sensitization out there of the need to get back Vaccines. But for the most part, we're, you know, we haven't done enough and we're not out there well enough to be able to convince people that this is safe, that we are, you know, that they're and, and that they're available. Um, you know, it was really started to it started to get some traction before the earthquake. Now that this happened, 
you know, sort of all efforts and all focuses on that, but we're still very committed to making sure that the, sens the sensitization and getting people to understand and get educated around it is happening in full force. Uh, Sean, uh, and I, I pelted you with questions about this a couple weekends ago uh, for a piece we just did, but um, I think people want to understand and, and, and uh, uh, hear a little bit about Haiti and your connection um, and, and what you found so compelling about that country to have made such a commitment to it over, over so much time, because there are other people who have also been drawn to it, and it's, uh, it sounds like there's something very moving once you get down there and see the way that 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 country works well I, you know when i went I, uh, so much of this was accidental uh, and, and you know to my fortune but despite uh, you know the reasons around it um it, it, it was because i happened to be free at the time i had never been to haiti went down with this this notion that we would spend a couple of rent a couple of trucks find a couple of uh, people at grit and ride around and get these uh, uh, intravenous pain medications distributed. While down there, uh, there were two things that were happening. One is I saw what I considered to be uh, largely dis the dysfunction of so many NGOs, not all, but so many. And, uh, and I felt that there might be a better, more direct way to handle as initially it was just the emergency issues of the earthquake uh, and later into development but all of that was was happening while what started as a as a group of um of americans coming in uh we began to pick up leadership from within haiti and then it became a dominantly haitian run organization so we we it the, then following their lead, in a sense, was what was inspiring about it. The people of Haiti, we, we are, we, you know, we can talk till the end of the world about how extraordinary they are, having faced this, you know, the kind of relentless wrath of uh, living devils and whatever sort of gods on the natural and the man-made disaster front. Uh, but there's still so much fight in them. And and I think that there's a kind of sacred duty, uh, you know, when one crosses paths with that that, that personality of humanity to to uh, stand behind them. Sean, you uh, you have a film coming out this week, uh, Flag Day, which is very important to you. your daughters in it. Uh, you directed it. You're in it. Uh, but I wonder, knowing you, uh, is there a part of you that says? Uh, I don't think I'm going to go to a press conference and talk about this movie, or I don't need to go to a, a screening. I need to get to Haiti right now, and I need to help Anne out and work with her. Uh, is that discussion in uh, polite terms going on back of house right now? It's, it's my um, uh, decision to do both, actually, because I do believe that movies can, at their best, be a kind of profound medicine. Uh, and I believe in this movie. I want people to see it. I especially want people to see it theatrically, which it will be exclusively for a, for a time. However, I also must say, as much as I want people to come see Flag Day uh, in a theater, I do not want people. I would request that anyone who is not vaccinated do not come and 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 either wait to see it or not uh, when it streams or not see it. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I've been, I, 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 fortunately, I have a great team, so they're able to have gotten uh, just as good a, a start on what they're doing uh, under Anne's leadership as as with me down there, and maybe stronger because you know you don't have two chefs in the kitchen. Um, I'll be down next week, and uh, yeah, I think I, I on this stuff uh, with such a strong organization and with such a strong CEO. I'm able to walk and chew gum at the same time and to, to, to honor my commitment to both. Lost him. No, went, went back for a second.
Lee from Core. Um, we're gonna get him back. Sorry about that. Ooh, that was <laughs> a little creepy. Sorry. Um, hey, I'm gonna change the subject a little bit. I've got my Dr. Fauci mug here, as you can see. It's been through a lot. I dropped it once, so it's got no handle on it. But um, you know, we're de we're dealing with this fourth wave of uh, of the coronavirus, basically. And we've just seen in the last couple of days talk about boosters and, and getting that uh, a timetable for that. Uh, and tell us about what uh, before you headed to Haiti. Uh, I'm sure that was top of mind. Uh, Core went from having, I think, seven employees in the United States to having thousands and running all these vaccination and testing sites. Uh, what's next as far as Core's involvement in that uh, process? Right now, we are going to be focusing on boosters, and there is a huge swath of folk who are still unvaccinated. So we're taking a much more ground approach to get down into those neighborhoods with trusted partners to make sure that everyone gets vaccinated. I mean, we're doing this in Brazil and India, and it's going to take the rest of the world at least a year and a half, a year, a year and a half to get fully vaccinated. In the time, you know, in that time span, not knowing what variant might be coming up again, it's just providing much more urgency for us not to just vaccinate outside, but also the remaining folks that are unvaccinated in the United States. On top of that, we also know that a lot of folk are sort of making difficult decisions, daily decisions of choosing vaccinations over missing work. And so we're seeing this huge gap between services and the folks that need it the most. So we're providing these resources around our vaccination sites and we want to grow that so that while you're getting, even if you're not going to get vaccinated and you're going to get tested and you want more information, you're not ready to get vaccinated. Well, we want to provide you with resources that you can have to make sure that you can have access to food and any of the, the, the dozens of organizations that are around as well as the federal city and the county programs that are around. Um, we're gonna do health screenings as well with our partner organization like Carbon Health and many others across the United States to make sure that we're really sort of a, a community point that is surrounding all of the issues that have been uncovered because of this virus, that there's a huge gap of access to health and resources in these communities. How do you um, balance, uh, you know, you have this huge group of people that have not been vaccinated, uh, and then you have this huge group of people, basically everybody in my house, who want to get a booster shot, like tomorrow. So uh, how do you balance getting to those people who haven't even taken the shot for whatever reason and, uh, and distributing the booster? Because we seem to need that booster. We're hearing about so many breakthroughs right now. I think we've developed a huge amount of capacity operationally to kind of expand and contract as needed. And you need to have both. That's why we've been very flexible to create these large static sites, these large fixed sites where huge numbers of people can come in, thousands per day, which we're very accustomed to, but at the same time have these tiny mobile units that are sitting within these little communities and having just a day-to-day -day personal conversation that's much more down onto the ground. You have to be able to do both, and I think that's why we've been so successful. I think it's because we've been very adaptive to the very different things that are needed to get this vaccine out. Uh, Sean, you, uh, it, it's, Always interesting to see someone who has a film coming out tell people to stay away if they uh, don't meet some condition. And uh, you go to these Q and A's and you say, "Hey, if you're just tell people who aren't vaccinated, do not come to my movie." Um, how do you deal with on a on a simple level the fact that we live in this glorious country uh, where there are wonderful things, but there are also so many people who are unwilling to get vaccinated or give you an argument for why it's taking away their liberties. Um, how do you deal with that? Because we have such a problem having conversations today. Uh, I guess yelling at them doesn't work. What do you do on a simple level here? Well, look, I would say irrationality is the religion of the radical libertarian in America today. And so I think that the strongest first step we can take is to focus on the larger group of Americans who do recognize that the great history of I individual independence and our country's independence is a recognition of interdependence. And we just have to put one foot in front of the other every day and, and, uh, and, and just assume that uh, 
you know, the the the, the church of that religion uh, will ultimately collapse because it really doesn't have a foundation in anything but fear and and rage and alienation. Um, we have a view, you know, we get viewer mail, as you know. Uh, we have a question from Judith in uh, Colorado. I'll let either of you take this. Uh, she has uh, asked about um, uh, the testing you've been doing and the vaccinations you've been doing in uh, Navajo Nation. You know, a, th a third of households, I think, lack plumbing and running water. Um, Tell us about how CORE got involved there and, and, and what uh, specifically took place. Yeah, um, the, I, again, I will quickly defer to Anne uh, in the follow-up. Uh, we went in to Navajo Nation very early. Uh, the, there, I, I think we were able to be very productive there, in, particularly because, you know, it's, it's, there, are, there are challenging cultural um uh hurdles in terms of uh making sure that uh that there's a trust there's been a lot of violation of trust um from outsiders coming in and i think by start we started to work with president nez um right in the initial uh, uh testing period and and with uh, the indian health service and and johns hopkins uh who's had a pre who have had a presence and a trusted presence uh, there uh, for about four decades, but Anne can give you more detail. We, we went down and really sort of, what we learned in Navajo Nation is, is what sort of, uh, it was the base of how we responded in so many places. You know, the testing and the, the contact tracing piece was only one tiny piece of the puzzle. To actually affect change, we realized we needed to have other resources, food from World Central Kitchen that we organized, as well as shelter, because a lot of people asking them to separate out was very difficult. Um, asking people to, you know, wash their hands when they don't have running water. So having hygiene kits and setting up water stations. So the package of services that we, we, we brought together alongside all these partners was really this incredible, you know, push for us to kind of bring that to all the other cities as well. So I really, you know, give a lot of, of credit to, you know, President Nez and Dr. Jill and our partners at the Center for American Indian Health because they said clearly, you know, this is not going to be enough for us to actually lower the rate and make sure that people are not getting sick. We need this entire package of services, which then sort of brings us back to, you know, Los Angeles and ensuring that again, people have resources alongside their testing and their vaccinations. When you, when you look at, uh, I mean, we as a country, we live blessed lives and we uh, sometimes think, oh, it's over there and someone will take care of it or the government will fly over and drop food. Uh, on a very basic level, explain to us why CORE is so essential to a relief effort in Haiti, for example, or why these NGOs are so important. And part two is you said at the beginning, uh, you know, people can help not by sending uh, shoes, but by contributing, if, if someone's watching this today, tell them specifically what they can do to help in a, a crisis moment like this in Haiti. Yeah, I'll, I'll start on that, which is, which is this, this that, um, as Anne said, you know, there, there are greater, in many ways, far greater challenges in this earthquake than 2010, just in terms of ac access of resources and personnel. Um, so this is not one of those situations where we, as an organization in, in, in country, would ask for volunteer, a lot of volunteers and so on, while, while certainly there are needs um, for medical professionals. Um, but I, I think this is one of those times where, the, where immediately uh, organizations like CORE need the resources to pull the trigger on, on projects to be able to move forward and be aggressive and, and get the job done with our Haitian partners. Uh, Sean, um, obviously this is a different administration. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, do you see an immediate impact on the ground and does that make you, when you're doing uh, work, uh, trying to get people vaccinated and tested, have you seen an immediate change or are there things that our government is not doing that you say, boy, we could really use this. It would really help. And it's not as they're not as helpful as we were, were hoping. 
Well, uh, for example, in, in Haiti, I know that the USS Arlington is on, on its way. I know that they've mobilized many um, uh, Blackhawks and Chinooks, as well as the uh, the Coast Guard um, uh, a a aviation um, resources. Um, but I think that that uh, right now, in terms of uh, to answer your question, in terms of Haiti, um, I do believe that uh, we should offer a stronger security force on the ground uh, right now. Um, that, <clears throat> and, and, and of course, you know, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers can also be very helpful and may well be there for, for all I know. Uh, in the United States, going back just for a second to re reference the Navajo Nation, the, one of the lessons that we can take away from our experience in the Navajo Nation, our, our, our American experience, all of us in this country, and celebrate about what they teach us is uh, that you know there is a traditional reverence for their elders, and in that there was a great buy-in, community buy-in to not I, not make this about identity politics or a rebel yell, but it, to to really care for their their oldest and their youngest, and so we want to see that happen. Haiti has never experienced an addiction to comfort. They've never had the supply for that addiction. Uh, we have so largely here in the United States. And I think now that, you know, we're facing these existential climate issues and all, all of the rest, uh, it, it's, it's, it's going to be essential to look to those who have, have been resilient in those situations and spiritually resilient and, and found kindness towards each other and in these kinds of hardest times. On all of that, in terms of the shift in the administration, it's a radical improvement, a radical improvement. At the same time, I, we sit here today, we all know about what's happening in Afghanistan, in Haiti, in our own country, throughout the world with these things. And it's a, uh, it's a challenge that, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that they are, they being the administration, are finding their footing and one foot in front of the other uh, as we are seeking to do on a micro level. Uh, right to, to date, our, um, uh, our feeling is that they have been responsive and, uh, and most appreciated was the immediate clarifying of principles that finally happened once the Biden administration uh, took office. Um, hey, look, we uh, could talk to you two for hours, but you actually have things to do that are important. Uh, and so thank you so much for, uh, for this conversation, a very important and timely one. And uh, thank you for all you're doing. And Anne, we'll be thinking of you and uh, we hope you're safe and uh, uh, we appreciate what, what you're doing there in Haiti. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And folks, uh, to see about our uh, upcoming programs, we have a, a robust schedule on Washington Post Live. Go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Um, and uh, I'm Jeff Edgers, and have a great day.